What are your thoughts on the recent US elections and Barack Obama's win? Sure. Uh, well, you know, the two major parties in the US are like Coke and Pepsi. <laughs> and basically we've now got Pepsi. We've had Pepsi for four years. We've got Pepsi for another four years. Then we're going to go back to Coke. Right. Uh, there, there is really no difference between Obama and between the, the Republicans and, and the Democrats. There, there is a difference in nuance, a difference in style, a, a difference in rhetoric, because the, and it's very similar to what we have between the Labour and the Liberal Party here in Australia. You're, of course, from the UK, but again, I'm sure it's very similar there too. You, you have one party which is considered to be conservative, considered to be supporting free enterprise and uh, the, um, the capitalist sort of engine, and the other being a bit more, uh, a bit more nanny state oriented, a bit more wanting to redistribute wealth, and a bit more left wing. Uh, and the, the pendulum always swings between these two. And at the moment, the pendulum has swung one way. And what I've found in my study for many years is that, is that these two uh, extremes are simply a, a method or a mechanism of keeping people under control and actually preventing any real dissent that goes out because because they're not they're not different enough they don't provide real alternatives so uh, my feeling about it is that there's there's really n no change and people need to understand that and then insist on a change and I think if people were to form their own grassroots organizations of course Ron Paul who, who was a Republican in the US did make a difference but uh, again he was too small he he's his ability to reach people was very good, but the ability of the media to control perceptions was so good that, that Ron Paul once again had very little impact. So it's, it's you know, just old wine in a new bottle. Things haven't changed. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Could you please give us your thoughts on the recent US elections and Barack Obama's win? Um, well, it's a continu continuity of agenda and it wouldn't matter whether Nick Romney got in or Obama, it's a continuation of agenda. They're both puppets of the same side. The, the left versus right is complete rubbish. Anybody who thinks the Liberals are going to save us from, from Labor or... Um, you know, in, in America, that uh, that left's going to save us from right, or, or right, vice versa, is is delusional. There is a continuity of agenda. I think Obama is very key to keep this whole um, agenda going. They're, I think they're about to implement their third and final act, and he's very, very key to that. Obama is a complete puppet. Um, no one really knows who he really is. Uh, he's um, he's not really Barack Obama for a start. His name's Barry Satoro. His birth certificate is a complete absolute lie. Go and do 10 hours research on that and you'll find out that he's not actually Barack Obama. Um, he was brought up by people like Bernadine Dawn and William Ayres who ran the Weather Underground movement in um, America which was a communistic front that, uh, that actually blew up things and uh, uh, he celebrated his first um, uh, win as senator in, in, in Bernadine Dawn's and William Ayres' house. Uh, he was brought up by Frank Marshall Davies, another uh, full-blown full -blown communist. Uh, so uh, Obama isn't who you think he is. Obama's a very, very slick salesman, um, but he is uh, part of their agenda and he is a puppet for them. He's a uh, teleprompter reader. He's a very slick salesman, very good orator, but he's leading us off the, the cliff. And uh, I think the continuity of agenda, they're very close to getting what they, what they need done. I mean, he's introduced uh, four, um, about four quantitative easing packages, which is basically printing huge sums of money to keep the financial system uh, alive. Since 2008, they rushed through 24 hours, um, an immediate monetary saving of the financial system that they believed that if it wasn't bailed out, the whole global financial system would have melted down. Now, there's been three of those and there'll be another fourth one if the um, the US go the way that the, I think people are suggesting they're going to go on Christmas and the debt levels are ridiculous so the debt levels in America is 20 uh, trillion dollars or close enough to but the true debt levels once you add up 
the toxic derivatives and share swaps uh, has the debt at uh, you know seven hundred trillion dollars. Yeah, once they got rid of Glass Eagle, which Bill Clinton did, um, it basically opened up the banking and finance um, industry to a casino royale type model. So there are all these toxic derivatives and share swaps that are basically worthless floating around in this currency system, which is not backed by gold or silver. The only reason the financial system has any merit at all is because we give it belief. We believe that it has value. And this is another illusion. And once that illusion um, is broken, that monetary system is worthless. It is worthless right now. It's just that we haven't, um, we're still pumping belief into it. Yeah. And uh, once that collapses, there is no backup to the financial system. We have one financial system, and once that financial system collapses, uh, there is no backup. So if there's a collapse of the financial system, which I believe there will be, um, I think it'll be inevitable in the next year or the next year, uh, but I think 13, 13 is a very demonic number, and they love using 13 as a problem reaction child, Apollo 13 and so forth. I believe that they'll collapse the system next year, and you won't be able to get money out of the bank and uh, you won't be able to get groceries. There's only a few days worth of groceries kept in a supermarket, probably five, six days. So 10, in 10, 15 days, you'll see this normal civilised society turn into mayhem because you won't be able to get food. And no one here creates their own food. They buy it from a local supermarket. Um, nobody here really understands how the financial system works or how precarious it is. There's no backup to the financial system. You have backup for if your bus doesn't arrive, or if your train doesn't arrive, or if your phone system goes down. But there's no backup for the financial system. And when it does collapse, it's going to inflict an enormous amount of pain. And, uh, and I think the people have got to start realising the precarious position that we're in. And the US elections is just a c continuity of their third and final act. Uh, I believe there's one final major act that they need to inflict upon the people to get what they want, which is a, uh, a new world order, basically. Um, so have a single government, a single uh, financial system, a single defence system, and this will allow them to control the world. And anybody speaking up about this uh, will be put into jail, shot, killed. I mean, already in America right now, they're going to collapse the middle class. There will be no middle class. They're doing this in, a, in, in, in America right now. Uh, there will be no middle class. There'll be the haves and the haves nots. It'll be very Hunger Game uh, type existence where you have the very rich and the large majority is impoverished. And this is exactly what they want. The political flavour of choice to make that happen is communism. So that's why you see communism flourishing in everywhere around the world. Um, and clearly Obama has a communistic background. Julia Gillard here in Australia is a Fabian, Fabian background. So she's pushing communism. I'm not saying that the right government won't continue their agenda as well, or the conservative government. It's just that under a communistic government, say like a Chinese type rule, that's ideal to environment for them to fast track their agenda worldwide. And if they get what they want, there'll be nothing we can do about it. Um, if we get the, a new world order where habeas corpus, magna carta and your sovereign rights are taken away from you, there'll be nothing you can do about it. And anybody like myself or any of the other people who have figured out what's going on will be hunted down and will be jailed, killed or moved out the way just like they did in Roman times, uh, just like they did in the Great Crusades. And so we have to start figuring it out. We cannot no longer sit on the beach and be apathetic every day. We need to start uh, getting off our asses and figuring out what's going on because not only for ourselves, selfishly, but for our own kids and our own kids' kids. There's going to be nothing left of this place. We are all already enslaved to the age of 75, working ridiculous hours to live in a ridiculously expensive country. I mean, you come from the UK, but how expensive is this city in the middle of nowhere? Yeah. We've got a city that's 12,000 kilometres away from anything and we have to spend till we're 75 paying off a ridiculously artificially inflated house. Now, a house here is worth millions of dollars, but in reality it's worth 50000 $70,000. And so not only do we pay the million, two million dollars back, we pay it back three, four, five times. We're spending our entire lives playing back an illusion an illusionary financial system, an illusionary real estate market and uh, an illusionary government and we're enslaved here, we're working harder than we've ever have. The 50s and the 60s were great, the 70s were not too bad, but incrementally each year they take all this away from us to the point that we no longer have any rights at all. But it's just incremental each year so we don't really notice it until we get to 2012 and we realise we don't have anything but other than the fact that we're working our asses off. Both 
both parents work in a family, not just one. And we're all working to the point of absolute exhaustion. For what? How was it any better? We're, not, we're disconnected from each other. We don't talk to each other. We have no community uh, involvement other than potentially sport. So this whole illusion has to end for our own sake, but not just for our own sake, but for our kids and our, and our kids' kids. Um, we, we've been dumbed down. We don't know anything about astrology. We know nothing about the sun. We know nothing about science. We get told that petrol and dark oil is technology and our only substitute is nuclear. And this is all a lie. We, get, we don't get told anything about great... Um, thinkers such as Tesla or Walter Russell who really knew about free energy. We get this perpetuated lie told to us continuously and the only reason this lie is allowed to be um, um, continuing on um, is the fact that we we refuse to use our own independent thinking. We outsource our thinking to authority. We outsource our thinking to people like the government um, and the scientists who just continuously lie to us. In fact, um, I, I, I wouldn't mind just showing you a couple of things on that front. Okay, so this is the tidal change right here on Sydney Harbour. We're down at beautiful Camp Cove. And the uh, I just wanted to illustrate the lies that have been perpetrated onto the Australian people and the people worldwide. We are led to believe that there is a true scientific fact because all the scientists, if you believe their bullshit, are in agreement that, about climate change. But here we have the very, one of the most accurate tidal records in the world. This is the tidal records of no other than Fort Denison here in Sydney Harbour. And what it shows you is that the tide has not really moved at all um, in literally a hundred years. We're looking at about five centimetres of change. Now look at the graph and tell me that this looks outrageous. It's moved from around about 90 to 95 centimetres. So if the water hasn't risen in the last hundred years, what are the chances of it rising in the next hundred years? Probably little or none. But they don't tell you about that. And the information that's coming from Fort Denison has been hushed up and suppressed. We only get the information given to us by croc organisations like the IPCC and the CSIRO, these lying bastards, these treasonous lying bastards, and we take that information without even questioning it. Now, let's have a look at some other interesting statistics. Um, let's have a look at the temperature. So we know that the tide hasn't moved. Now, the tide, above everything, would indicate that the weather's changed dramatically, but five centimetres of water movement in 100 years is typical of any century in the last 1,000 years. Now, here, uh, I'm not too sure if you can get that, if you got that, this is the temperature change over the last, um, well, the last 1,000 years, from um, uh, the 1,000th century up to the year 2000. And you can see here that we went to two degrees above the norm, if you like, the median temperature for the last millennia, the last thousand years, in the medieval uh, warm period with the Viking uh, colon colonised Greenland. And you can also see down here that it got very, very cool for a large chunk of time. You can see that the, the gaps under the line are probably more than above the line. So we spend most of our time in freezing cold conditions. And in these cold conditions here, the, uh, the River Thames in the, the UK freezes over. So from around 1600 to just getting up before the 1900s, you can actually see black and white photos of the Thames frozen over. Um, not that long ago, only uh, 100 or so years ago. And that's the little bubble there is where we are now, about a degree warmer. So is the temperature today uh, any significantly di different from any other period in the last thousand years? And the answer to that question is, isn't any different at all. Um, there's no change in temperature and there's no change in water levels. So what, what problem are we fighting? And if we go back and look at, say, um, here's the, uh, the United States, you can see there in 1930 what the temperature in the United States are, and you can see what it is in 2000, it's actually gone down. It's actually gone down. So the, the temperature is not out of control by any stretch of the imagination. And um, I've got another one that uh, shows us, here's the CO2. Now CO2 is plant food, it's not, it's not a pollutant. Um, it's actually plant food, it's a naturally occurring substance and without it we'd all die. 
And we've had periods on the planet where we've had significantly more CO2 and it's been significantly water, uh, warmer. But then the two aren't really correlating to each other. It gets hotter and when it gets hotter it releases more CO2. Now CO2 is a small percentage of the atmosphere. It's like one thirtieth of the atmosphere. And human CO2 is only 2% of the CO2. And Australia contributes about 2% of the 2%. So we're introducing a tax to alter 0.000005% of the, of the atmosphere. It's totally insane. And even if this had any alteration on the, on the, uh, the temperature, which it won't, what would that do And compared to, say, China or the United States? There's Australia down the bottom there. And you can see the amount of CO2 that China produces goes logarithmically towards the end. So we're shipping no problems at all coal. Um, just up the road from Newcastle, the ships come nearly all the way down here to Sydney, where it's one of our greatest exporters. We're shipping coal to China, who's producing, you know, hundreds, thousands of times more CO2 than we, we are, and of course the United States, as well as a contributor, yet we've put a tax here thinking that we can control the, a naturally occurring substance in the atmosphere. I'm only illustrating this to show you the sense of stupidity that is going on in the world with no more than 15 minutes of study with a, with a local climatologist such as Bob Carter in Australia would you find that this is a complete lie. Yet you go and watch the 730 project with uh, imbeciles like David Hughes and, uh, and uh, Amanda Keller and they'll tell you that all the scientists are in agreement. But they fail to tell you that there's 30,000 signed scientists that tell you that's complete and absolute bullshit. So. What I'm telling you here is you don't need to know much to realise you've been lied to. You don't need much at all, but unfortunately we believe pathologically in our government. We believe in pathological lies like Julia Gillard and CSIRO and the IPCC, which has been caught fudging the figures. We found their emails um, which are, are titled Hiding the Decline, yet we do nothing about it. Um, here is the temperature over the last 15 years, and you can see since 19. 89, the temperature has actually gone down somewhat, stayed even or gone down. So if we were in cataclysmic climate change, global, of course, by the way, in the 70s we were, they were telling us that it was going to be an ice age. Uh, then we were told by none other than the idiot Al Gore, one of the most lying demonic people on the planet, that, and we all took the uh, bait, hook, line and sinker, that we were going for a cataclysmic global warming. Now that got changed to climate change because as you can see in the last 15 years, unfortunately it has not been heating up. So this whole thing is a total lie and why are they introducing a uh, a carbon tax because energy is important if they make energy expensive they basically slow down society and that's what they want they're deliberately handicapping us they do not want us to be pro prosperous they do not want us to be free they do not want us to be sovereign individuals with liberty they want us to be dumbed down human beings basically taking it every single day um, and not asking any questions and any of us who do ask questions we're labeled uh, everything under the sun including conspiracy theorists yet we're the people that are waking up and if the other we only need 10% of the population to wake up to institute change you know 90% of the population are too dumb to get it but 10% of the smart people on this planet that know what's going on have got to stand up now and we have got to fight before it's too late You're watching Ozzy TV. You're watching Ozzy TV.